All right, well, we're going to welcome everyone to our webinar presentation today. The topic is Borrelia Diagnostic Update. Um, I'd like to thank you uh, for joining us today. Our speakers are me, Amanda, and uh, Dr. Jennifer Miller, who's our Director of Research and Development at Galaxy and Assistant Lab Director. She so oversees all the day-to-day -day lab operations at Galaxy. A few notes for participants. Uh, this webinar is being recorded for future use. Uh, everyone will be muted during the presentation. There will be a Q&A time at the end. And we invite you to drop any questions or comments in the chat. Um, you're welcome to do that during the presentation. Uh, and during the Q&A uh, period, if there are fewer <clears throat> than 20 people on, we'll promote everyone to panelists so uh, we can have an open discussion. And if you're having any technical difficulties, uh, please send a uh, DM, a direct message to Karen Kilburn. She's our tech support. Um, and I'd also like to um, thank Karen and Victoria Quiet for um, their assistance with the webinar today. So to begin with, um, for those of you who are not familiar with um, Galaxy Diagnostics, uh, we are a... Um, a medical lab located in Research Triangle Park, North Carolina. Our mission is to advance molecular and immunologic testing for hard to detect flea and tick-borne diseases, uh, notably, of course, Lyme disease, uh, Borreliosis or Borrelia species infection, and also uh, cat scratch disease, Bartonella bartonellosis um, species infection. These are emerging infectious diseases. Um, we're a spin out from North Carolina State University. We have an ongoing collaboration with our uh, co-founders and colleagues there um, and at a number of other top academic institutions. We really see ourselves as a prototyping and early commercialization platform for new technologies. Our goal is to identify tests that uh, we can scale either through, um, you know, transferring onto a high throughput platform and licensing out to big labs or creating IVD kits that will uh, run on high throughput systems. We're uh, a one health comp a company, which is what that signal, that symbol is up in the um, top right hand corner. So we're working at the nexus of human health, animal health and health of the environment. I think you're I think that uh, flea and tick-borne diseases or vector-borne diseases generally are a really important One Health topic and area of, of research and advancement. We provide testing to uh, providers in human health, but also to providers in veterinary sciences and um, medical practice. And we do uh, a lot of clinical research support. So we provide testing for uh, a number of different types of um, clinical research projects. So that's our company. Um, so when we come at this problem of advancing diagnose, diagnostic tools for providers uh, in flea and tick-borne disease, I like to share this um, slide because people often ask us, for example, what's your positive rate for your testing? And the answer is, you know, it's not indicative. It's really hard to tell you whether that's a number you should care about, right? So the reason we do research studies with tightly defined samples is to really effectively characterize the performance of the assay in a, in a targeted clinical population. Um, when we're looking at what uh, contributes to the uh, test performance in our laboratory, we know that there are factors down here at testing in the lab. We know that there are factors around how the samples are collected, sample integrity, chain of custody. Um, and we also know that um, some doctors uh, are much more experienced and, and often skilled at figuring out what a, which patients are likely to test positive. And that really comes down to what, uh, you know, prior exposure to vector borne so the high and high risk groups and the associated symptoms and disease states. And is, uh, if you're new to the area of flea and tick-borne diseases, um, it's important for you to know that this is a very early stage of, of research. Um, and so our understandings of what clinically meaningful indicators are of a potential positive um, patient are still evolving. So this is really important. And the reason why uh, diagnostic technologies aren't more advanced at this point is that there are some 
very clear technical challenges associated uh, with advancing diagnostics in this space. Our focus, of course, is on slow growing, low abundance infections in clinical samples. And these are our uh, these are the types of infections where conventional techniques often don't uh, really aren't that accurate or reliable. We're also designing tests that focus on the pathobiology of infection, which can vary considerably across um, you know different um, genera and species of infection. And of course, you know we tend to be a little U.S. focused, as U.S. labs tend to be. Um, but a lot of these infections have variable. Uh, geographic distribution, not only across the United States, but around the world and people travel. So as clinicians, you want to know, uh, you want access to tools that help you diagnose a patient no matter where they've, they've traveled in the world. Um, and then how we're going after sample enrichment is really the, the term of art that we use to describe how we're approaching uh, you know, diagnostic improvements for these low abundance um, infections. We're working with three different technologies. When Galaxy launched, we launched using this enrichment method. So Bartonella alpha proteo growth medium for, for increasing the sensitivity of uh, DNA detection uh, for Bartonella species infection. This is a medium where we can increase the, the bacterial load so that we're more likely to aliquot the small bit we take out for DNA testing, aliquot out, um, you know, something that actually has the organisms in it. Then we started working with DDPCR, drop, digital droplet PCR or digital PCR, which effectively does manipulate the sample. So instead of running one PCR on an aliquot, we're, you're, we're running, uh, we're taking that aliquot and breaking it into 10 to 20,000 droplets and running a reaction in each droplet. This is a technology we're applying to Borrelia, Bartonella, Babesia, and other tick-borne diseases. Um, and we have our first offer, our first offerings out right now for Bartonella. Um, and then the third technology we're working with is nanotrap capture. And our first application here is Borrelia, which is a, an important focus of our presentation here today. Um, and nanotrap capture um, we're using protein capture right now, and so using magnetic beads, we can effectively, you know, capture any of the proteins that are in the test sample, sort of like a magnet, pulling it in, spinning it down, and then test the concentrate. Um, and these are really powerful technologies we're going after different applications on. Um, and so at this point, um, I'm going to invite Jen, who is a brilliant expert, <laughs> well-published, and has been working uh, in this uh, disease area for a long time to walk you through an introduction to, um, to the disease and talk about some of the diagnostic advances we're working on. Jen? Okay, thanks, Amanda. So I just want to start, um, start by talking about uh, a few things about Lyme disease and, and Lyme Borrelia disease associations. So what you're looking at in the bar graph below it, to the left of your screen are annual cases of Lyme disease in the U.S. And very quickly, what you'll see is that the number of cases reported to the CDC and estimated total cases has been steadily upticking uh, throughout the years. This particular bar graph goes back to 1988, and what you see is a, a very steady uptick, both as the incidence of Lyme disease in the United States grows and as our awareness of the disease grows. And so right now, we're looking at an estimated 467,000 cases per year in the United States. And of course, uh, this is a very large number. Uh, Lyme disease is the number one vector-borne uh, disease in the United States. So Lyme disease was, was um, as we'll get into in a minute, first described uh, many years ago. And so... There's a couple different definitions of patients that are tracked. Uh, patients that are, have, exhibit persistent symptoms um, following antibiotic treatment, Lyme disease dates back to studies done in the 80s. And so the term post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is, is really a disease definition that was designated so that specific research studies could be conducted. It's not really meant uh, to exclude or um, diminish those with chronic Lyme disease. 
of which post-treatment Lyme is a form of chronic Lyme disease, but certainly there are other forms of, of chronic Lyme disease as well that, that are utilized by clinicians and certainly by patients that are exhibiting um, myriad of symptoms. Uh, the first case definition for post-treatment Lyme disease or PTLDS was first described in 2003 and then again in 2006. And like I said, this is very important as a a research tool, but in no way covers the full spectrum of, of chronic disease. And that's because as, as many of you know, what is depicted here on the right is there's multiple different signs and symptoms of Lyme disease that can emerge days to months after tick bite, including neurological symptoms like facial palsy, short-term memory loss, headache, uh, respiratory episodes, dizziness, shortness of breath, uh, heart issues, heart palpitations, irregular heartbeat, in the case of uh, severe Lyme carditis, heart block, uh, other neuroborreliosis symptoms, you can get inflammation of the brain, spinal cord, uh, nerve or radiculopathies that can radiate down your arm, uh, intermittent pain, so various myalgias. Of course, a symptom that, that many people are familiar with is, is arthritis, uh, usually affecting a large joint. Uh, you can get severe joint pain and swelling. And then the other thing that, that is documented in the literature is of course, people know that some people start out with a Lyme disease rash, but in some instances you can get what's known as a disseminated uh, EM rash where the rashes will sew up on other parts of your body, sometimes quite distinct from the area where it first originated. Next slide. So Borrelia are stealth pathogens. And as we just mentioned, uh, in the United States, there's 476,000 diagnosed Lyme disease cases where people are treated. And there's greater than 200,000 cases per year just in Western Europe alone. Of course, Lyme disease also affects other parts of the world and including uh, parts of Asia. Uh, many of you know that the um, Type member of the genus Borrelia burgdorferi was originally discovered in Lyme, Connecticut, hence the name Lyme disease. Uh, Alan Steer discovered it as an agent that was causing juvenile arthritis in, in a group of children back in 1977. Uh, the spirochete was first grown and visualized and, and isolated by uh, Willie Bergdorfer uh, in the early 80s, uh, hence the name Bergdorferi, named for him. Um, quite revolutionary, the, the first studies where this organism was able to be grown in a very specialized and complex media. So Borrelia, all members of the genus Borrelia are, are, are most members, are transmitted by ticks, uh, carried by rodents, deer, and birds. There are 52 Borrelia species that fall into two different uh, phylogenetic groups. You have the Lyme disease agents and the relapsing fever group. Uh, the reference I made to most being carried by, by uh, Ticks is, of course, you have uh, louse-born louse relapsing fever, which is obviously transmitted by lice. So Lyme Borrelia has been implicated in a whole range of disseminated diseases, as we just discussed, affecting the heart, central nervous system, and joints. And Borrelia are spirochetes. Spirochetes are, are sort of an unusual group of bacteria. They're not technically gram-negative or gram-positive. If you were to attempt to gram-stain a spirochete, they would very weakly stain gram-negative. This is due to their unique uh, membrane architecture. And because spirochetes are unique, uh, as we'll discuss in a few minutes, they have a unique way of, of burrowing into tissues and hiding. And for this reason, as well as many others, uh, treatment failure with Lyme disease is unfortunately common. The other thing I want to point out is that one of the other vexing features of um, really Burgdorferi and, and other Lyme spirochetal infections is that the acquired immune response is, is complicated and delayed. And so typically with an antibody response, you get an early antibody response where you get a peaking of IgM antibodies. Uh, and for Borrelia, this is delayed. You often don't see complete conversion uh, to an IgM response for four to six weeks. And by this time, you know, you, patients that have an erythema migrans, which is certainly not everybody, and flu-like illnesses may very well have gone on to develop other symptoms before they've even produced detectable antibodies. 
And then of course you have early disseminated Lyme disease where you can have neurological symptoms, uh, inflammatory symptoms of the joint, or even heart symptoms. And in a group of these patients, they may have class switched from IgM to IgG. And, and again, this, take, this is delayed with Borrelia. It, can, it occurs after six to eight weeks of infection. But it's been well documented in the literature that certain patients don't class switch effectively or in some cases at all, which can make tracking of Borrelia infection by antibodies a bit problematic. And then of course, in late phases of, of Lyme disease, you can continue to have neurological symptoms and you can have chronic arthritis symptoms as well. And then of course, not on this chart or other forms of, of chronic or post-treatment Lyme disease where you can have these symptoms or other symptoms, uh, continued memory loss, uh, pain, intermittent fatigue, uh, other symptoms as well. Next slide, please. And so the other final thing I'll point out is that these Borrelia, uh, Lyme Borrelia, and also relapsing fever Borrelia, to some extent, are involved in polymicrobial infections. This idea that tick-borne diseases form part of a pathobiome or an entire panel of infections that can be picked off sometimes simultaneously from a vector. For example, we know that ticks can transmit a wide variety of pathogens, sometimes all at once, uh, not only uh, Borrelia burgdorferi, but um, other viral pathogens, uh, the tick-borne pathogens like uh, Anaplasma and Ehrlichia, uh, parasites like Babesia, you know, and, and we're now beginning to understand that this pathobiome is, is really complicated. It can affect uh, pathogenesis of, of multiple infections, depending upon which was present first, and also the immune response because you're getting assaulted on all fronts and the various forms of, of tissue or, or other damage that can occur as a result of, of infections. And so studying the pathobiome as a whole becomes very important. Next slide, please. So this is just a, a, a brief uh, pictorial slide. As we said, there's two different classes of, of Borrelia. There's Lyme disease and relapsing fever. This uh, looks like a color wheel to the right here is a phylogenetic uh, image. And what you'll notice is that the various, various species of infection are highlighted. So the Lyme Borrelia species are highlighted in blue primarily, but as you move sort of uh, counterclockwise around the circle, the, the blue runs into the purple. Uh, the purple is the recently discovered described Borrelia maonii species, which as you'll see shares features with Lyme Borrelia, but it also shares some features with relapsing fever Borrelia, which are sort of at the top of the circle and you have various colors, yellow, uh, magenta, red. Uh, the red is the Borrelia miyamotai, which was recently discovered. That's a relapsing fever species. And with the maonai, you know, it, it shares a lot of features with Lyme Borrelia, but one of the relapsing fever features that it shares is it replicates to higher levels in the blood than Lyme Borrelia do. And so this is kind of a phylogenetic highlighting of, of the different species within the genus. Uh, some of you may be aware that there was a fairly recent proposal to reclassify Borrelia as a genus into the genus Borreliella. And in the Borreliella designation, uh, the Borreliella would apply to the, the Lyme Borrelia and the designation Borrelia would be reserved for relapsing fever. There's still a lot of debate about this, so we, we chose not to use that terminology here. Another thing to think about with various Borrelia spirochetes is, is you have also have designations based upon conserved versus variable proteins. So for example, with Lyme Borrelia, the outer surface protein A, which many of you are familiar with, or OSP A, is actually conserved fairly well across all Lyme Borrelia. You don't really have a, a major sequence derivation. And this was part of the reason that, that it was thought to originally have been a, a good vaccine candidate and why it's often a diagnostic target of interest. In contrast, OSP-C or outer surface protein C, also a major virulence determinant of Borrelia burgdorferi. It varies widely across various strains of Borrelia. In other words, a, a B31 OSP-C looks different from an N40, from a ZS7. And so there's lots of different serotypes of, of OSP-C, and that's something to keep in mind when anytime you're talking about serology is that the ability of antibody to recognize a target can differ if, if the sequence of that target is varied. 
And then relapsing fever, some of you may be familiar with the uh, GLIP-Q protein, which is a uh, diagnostic marker for relapsing fever spirochetes. There's also different clinical implications for these spirochetal infections. Uh, relapsing fever Borrelia, as the name implies, are, are characterized by a high cyclical relapsing, resolving bacteremia in the blood where the bacteria replicate to high numbers in the blood. Uh, the immune system starts to catch up right around the time you get antibody mediated kill off, the bacteria changes surface proteins and evades the antibody response. And so you get this up and down pattern. Whereas Lyme Borrelia are more stealth, they don't replicate uh, to high volumes in the blood. You know, they get into the blood, they get out and they really like to hide out and do their damage uh, within tissue cells and, and systems of the body where they can really burrow in and, and do their thing. And so because you have all of these different uh, basically spectra of Borrelia infections, it's always important to ask patients about travel history and, and vector contact and occupational exposure. Uh, basically so that we can cover the basis on how to detect and treat these uh, very complicated pathogens. Next slide, please. So pathogenesis of Lyme Borrelia is, is worth spending a couple minutes on. Um, Borrelia are very slow growing. You've, you've got a doubling time of 12 hours. Um, while they're extracellular pathogens, they can invade tissues and cells. And, and while they're inside those cells, you know, while they're in a tug of war with the cellular machinery, they can, they can cause quite a bit of damage. Uh, because like I said, they're spirochetes, they're, they're very corkscrew in their motion. So imagine a drill burrowing into tissues and cells and doing damage to underlying tissues. Uh, they'll cloak themselves with uh, tissue components that bind to various surface proteins they put on their surface, fibronectin, uh, decorin, just to name a few. Uh, they, will, they will form biofilms sometimes within the tissues. All of this makes it a lot harder for the immune system to detect them and eliminate them. Um, they do trigger uh, an innate immune response. You know, they're, they're delivered via tick bite. So you have, you know, the first line of defense are, are of course the cells within the skin. Um, and they do respond to Borrelia, but Borrelia also has a way of, of getting around that and, and hijacking so that they can disseminate and spread to distant tissue sites and cause inflammation and flu-like symptoms. Uh, some of this is, is through changing of the surface proteins that it displays on its surface to buy itself time uh, to disseminate from the skin into the blood and into tissue systems. The other thing to point out is that only about a quarter of all patients uh, develop an EM rash. So for a lot of the surveillance case definitions with the serological practices that are uh, recommended by the CDC and others, the initial criteria is the visualization of an EM rash, but only a quarter of the patients develop the EM rash. And of course, it's not always easy to see an EM rash on, on the skin of um, ethnicities that are, that are darker. It can be very hard to visualize. As I said before, the Lyme agents leave the blood uh, generally within two weeks and they, they do hide in, in biofilms. And they also form round body forms or persisters. The, the whole reason for this is unknown, but one hypothesis is in the presence of bacteriostatic antibiotics like doxycycline that work by slowing down the replication of the bacteria. The bacteria try to, may try to get around the mode of action of the antibiotic by slowing down their replication which causes them to change into a form where they're less metabolically active and therefore the antibiotic either doesn't penetrate or have as much of a mode of action. Next slide, please. So as we've mentioned, Lyme Borrelia are a low abundance infection. And so unlike with E. coli where the bacteria get in, they replicate you know, to very high levels. And so conventional limited detection is, is a sufficient sensitivity to detect what's there when you have stealth pathogens that are present at much, much lower limits. The conventional limited detection isn't going to suffice because it isn't going to pick up a stealth pathogen. And so stealth pathogen numbers, you know, may or may not progress over time in the blood, but your symptoms progress. And certainly you can have persistent microorganisms within tissues lurking in body sites away from the immune system. So we really need more sensitive uh, detection methods for detecting these pathogens. And as Amanda alluded, 
you know, this is where sample enrichment can become so very important so that we can boost those lower limits to something that is more easily detectable using tools that we have at our disposal. Next slide, please. So I want to introduce our newest test offering, the Lyme Borrelia Nanotrap test. Um, and this is utilizing the uh, nanotrap particle technology uh, pioneered by uh, series biosciences and, and scientists at George Mason University. And so the, the nanotrap is, is a direct detection method that, that confirms presence of, uh, confirms actual presence of an organism. And the way that it works is the beads target and concentrate the Borrelia burgdorferi ospe protein. And this is a urine test. And so the benefit to urine is that it's easy to collect sample, uh, especially for children. It's, it's less invasive. Uh, there's a lot less anxiety involved. And so studies have shown that, that using the nanotrap particles to, to concentrate and pull uh, OSP-A out of urine can improve detection by greater than 10%. And so when you look at nanotrap enrichment, coupled perhaps with the more conventional Western blot, you can increase the sensitivity and engine detection in urine. And so the George Mason team has published on these studies extensively. First publication was in 2015. This one is referenced here. And what we see is that the nanotrap assay allows us to pick up um, cases that are not detected with standard two-tier testing. So in this graphic, uh, this two-by-two this two, two table that you see over to the left, 23% of um, samples were detected by nanotrap but were two-tier negative. And then when you combine that with um, the samples that were detected by both methods, you were, they were able to detect uh, Lyme disease in 96% of the samples that they looked at. And this included 26 acute cases of Lyme disease, both with and without um, the clinically defined definition of, of an EM rash. And so the way this worked is it's paired urine and serum were collected at the initial visit. Serum was tested by two-tier testing for IgG and IgM, and the urine was tested with the nanotrap assay. And then um, we conducted an internal analysis of the data published in this paper, and when we crunch the numbers, what we saw was that based upon their designated patient cohort, it would appear that the assay had a 40% sensitivity in chronically ill patients, but this data requires uh, more analysis and research to further define clinical utility in this and other relevant populations. Next slide, please. So I alluded to the history of Nanotrap, but this is giving a little more um, in-depth information for those that are interested, as well as relevant references for those that want to go and, and dig a little bit deeper. As I said, the technology was originally developed by scientists at George Mason University and licensed to uh, series nanosciences. And you can see that they've published extensively on this technology. Um, antigen testing in urine has had a troubled history due in part to low concentration of antigens, but also stability of the antigens within urine. Um, the nanotrap particles that, that were pioneered by this group uh, really did a great job of, of changing that perception and dramatically increased the sensitivity through the antigen capture. Um, and how they did this is, is well laid out in the 2015 paper that's referenced here to the right. And this technology is, is well published for Lyme disease, and it's also been published for other tick-borne diseases. Uh, if you'd like to reference the 2020 science report paper here, uh, they, they investigate uh, other tick-borne illnesses there. It's also been used for tuberculosis, other parasites, including Toxoplasma gondii, Trypanosoma cruzi, and malaria parasite, Plasmodium falciparum. And then studies have been done with HIV and Zika viruses, and nanotrap capture is currently used for wastewater uh, surveillance testing for COVID-19. Uh, this is being combined with influenza. It's being utilized on college campuses, uh, United States Coast Guard installations, military vessels, and um, certain towns and cities. And so this technology is, is really very powerful. Uh, it, it's got wide application to um, a host of pathogenically important microbes. Next slide, please. So I just want to briefly mention that 
We take uh, quality very seriously at Galaxy Diagnostics, and what you're looking at are the test performance data for uh, the Nanotrap urine antigen test that we have validated and launched uh, as licensed from Ceres. And so we did an analytical validation. We calculated analytical sensitivity and specificity. Um, we did a clinical validation. We utilized blinded, uh, de-identified paired serum and urine obtained from Canadian patients presenting with Lyme borreliosis, uh, lookalike illnesses, or healthy controls. This is in collaboration with the Magnata Research Laboratory at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Ontario would be nice if I could talk. Uh, and we looked at serum reactivity using uh, standard two-tier testing using the CDC uh, criteria. And we also did the Lyme Borrelia nanotrap antigen test on the urine. What you can see is summarized below. We were able to detect more positives overall utilizing the nanotrap antigen test. But what was interesting was it seemed like there was a stratification in the sense that nanotrap picked up positives, the two-tier didn't, and vice versa. And so what this illustrated to us is that a combined approach utilizing both direct and indirect methods is going to be the best bet for maximizing diagnostic sensitivity. We have not been unblinded, so I can't speak to the clinical utility in depth yet of the patient population that we analyzed because we, we have not been unblinded. So stay tuned for more information there. And then I'll just briefly mention that even though this is not a quantitative assay, we assessed accuracy uh, by comparing expected versus observed test results, utilizing a twofold dilution series of spiked urine samples. And we tested a wide range of, of Borrelia burgdorferi uh, lysate spiked into these samples. And you can see that the accuracy is, is uh, quite achievable over a broad dynamic range. Next slide, please. So now I wanna to get to what I think is, is a really important area of emerging research and really starting to speak to the clinical utility of this assay for clinicians, because that's where the rubber meets the road. And so I'd like to present three of our uh, representative standout cases. So in case number one, we analyzed uh, urine and serum through various assays from a 57-year-old female from Singapore. We did not know anything about the clinical symptoms or signs of this particular patient, but the urine did test positive uh, with the Borrelia nanotrap antigen assay, while the ELISA was negative, this patient did have corresponding uh, IgM Western blot serology. So that, that's an interesting um, case. Um, like I said, we don't know anything about the clinical symptoms and signs, but it was interesting to us that we got a positive nanotrap antigen test and that lined up with a IgM Western blot positive serum response. In our second case, we tested an 18 year old female from Hawaii. This particular patient uh, was assigned the ICD-10 codes of Lyme disease, joint pain, interestingly, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and anxiety. While this patient did not order uh, Borrelia serology from us, they were also um, nanotrap antigen positive in urine. Um, this may harken back to some of the very early reports in the literature in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, so where there was an association made between expression of Borrelia burgdorferi ospe and, and arthritis. So this warrants more investigation, but I think it's worth pointing out. Case number three was a 42-year-old male from California. This particular patient had um, was assigned neurological ICD-10 codes uh, for neurological disorders, nervous system disorders, also muscle spasms and other myalgias. This patient, we also did not um, run serology on this patient, but this patient was also uh, nanotrap antigen positive in the urine. So this is intriguing to us uh, because it would be nice to do further studies to kind of investigate uh, utility of the nanotrap antigen urine assay for neuroborreliosis. And the other reason I bring up these case studies is, is we would like to invite uh, interested clinicians to partner with us so that we can do clinical utility studies utilizing paired urine and serum samples so that we can better define uh, clinical utility of the nanotrap urine antigen assay for various disease stages of Lyme disease. Next slide, please. 
So currently, Galaxy offers both direct and indirect uh, test offerings. Our direct detection methods, we've talked at length about the nanotrap antigen assay, and this is for urine samples of 40 mLs or above. We also do uh, Borrelia species PCR on non-blood fluid. These are genus level primers. Uh, any positive results would be confirmed by sequence analysis. The idea being that if you get a sequence, you would then know the genus and the species. Uh, these are research use only. And the reason we say they're best for non-blood fluid is again, Borrelia are very hard to detect in the blood. They're present at very, very low numbers. Similarly, we also offer a corresponding uh, tissue PCR-based assay. This works best on fresh or frozen tissue. This is because formalin and other cross-linking and denaturing agents cross-link the DNA to a point where it really damages the DNA and it's harder to detect. So in direct detection, we offer the um, standard two-tier ELISA and Western blot assays uh, for you know, detection of antibodies uh, to Borrelia burgdorferi proteins. So that's okay, you can go to the next slide. So antibody testing is tricky. So originally two-tier serology was, was devised as a surveillance tool. It was really meant to go out into the field and, and surveil prevalence. And so they needed something that, that was quick and, and amenable for surveillance, you know, responding to a wide range of antigens. Uh, the ELISA, which is the first tier, is, is, was always meant as a screening assay, okay? It's widely used. It indicates exposure. There is a trade-off between sensitivity and specificity uh, with serology, um, with, whether you're talking about the ELISA or the second tier Western blot. Uh, disadvantages, it's hard to standardize across labs. Different labs run different assays with different cutoff values. Uh, they utilize different sources of, of antigen. They have different criteria for interpretation of those results, different antibodies, you know, on and on and on, different ways of imaging. There is potential cross-reactivity with IgM. So as a molecule, IgM is a pentamer, which means it has five arms, whereas IgG only has two arms. And so because of it, it's more sticky and more things stick to it. So you also, with Borrelia, as we alluded to earlier, you have variation in gene expression and, and surface proteins, both, both during times of infection and between strains, and that can make interpretation of serology a bit tricky. And then, of course, aminoassay sensitivity is always dependent upon the species or strain that you utilize. So there's multiple, even with Borrelia burgdorferi, there's multiple strains, and there can be differences in, in migration patterns of the antigens of interest, just as one example. Other differences are whether you're using a cell cultivated or non-cell cultivated antigen, uh, whether that be a lysate, uh, whether you're using recombinant proteins, what species they come from, and then also the passage number of the bacteria. I didn't get into this, but Borrelia lose infectivity if they're passage too many times in culture. And the reason for that is they contain numerous extra chromosomal plasmids that are required for pathogenesis and they kick them out pretty quickly if, if they're cultured too many times. Next slide. So what we're recommending currently is, and I alluded to this before, is, is that clinicians utilize both direct and indirect testing methods uh, to maximize their potential for detection of Borrelia species. And so obviously the indirect would be the two-tiered testing, ELISA and Western blot, and direct methodology um, would be the Lyme borreliosis nanotrap uh, urine test. And again, because our internal data suggests that there's little overlap between patients that test positive with two-tier testing versus those that test positive with nanotrap, it, you're better off maximizing your chances by utilizing both since we suspect that we may be capturing different populations of patients. Slide, please. So what's next? So Nanotrap is novel technology. There's currently no um, insurance code for reimbursement. We have gone through, this is, a, this is a complicated process, but I'm proud to say that we are most of the way through this process. We've been assigned a code. And very soon we will be able to file uh, insurance and Medicare reimbursements for the nanotrap assay, which will, will be a great um, tool and relief to both providers and patients. 
We are also looking at uh, other applications of nanotrap, both to other protein-based methods uh, for Borrelia and other pathogens, but also there may be other uh, ways of, of utilizing the nanotrap, pot, cap, uh, nanotrap particles for nucleic acids. Uh, we are working on launching our droplet digital PCR technology for other pathogens, including uh, Borrelia, Babesia, and other tick-borne pathogens. We are very interested in development of multiplex assays uh, that are both serology and perhaps more detect, more direct detection so that we can further reduce the cost for our patients. Uh, we'd like to expand the standard of care serology for other pathogens, uh, such as anaplasma, rickettsia, babesia. Um, and we really would like to clarify the clinical importance of all of our assays through prospective research with interested parties, uh, pursue uh, government funding through NIH, uh, private foundation funding, because we really understand that we need to be able to define the clinical utility of each of these assays for clinicians. And finally, as Amanda alluded to in the beginning of her presentation, we'd like to partner. We are a, a prototyping platform and we want to partner to advance solutions and, and develop FDA approved products and kits uh, where applicable and, and necessary so that we can make more widely available all of these tools uh, for not only for other pathogens, but for potentially other labs to utilize. Next slide. Right. So Jen, here we're here at the end. And so I'm going to sound in um, and note that, you know, thank you so much for the overview and, um, and the detail on testing and a lot of the reasoning for why we do things the way we do. Um, I, I think there's a, a, a number of teams working hard out there to advance the sensitivity and accuracy or reliability of uh, testing tools. I think that um, speaking for our team, um, we don't think there's going to that there's going to be one tool. We think that uh, because of the um, you know broad range of uh, presentations uh, for Lyme borreliosis and the different requirements for uh, confirming acute you know disseminated or chronic stage disease, we think that there'll be a variety of tools, and so. Um, this is this is part of what drives our partnering strategy, right? We're we're interested in working with uh, researchers who have promising technologies. We are working, obviously, with um, research teams who have technologies that that we are really excited about um, because we just want to advance detection. We really want to help doctors um, do a better job at um, providing excellent patient care, and we also understand that this is emerging infectious disease, right? And so the clinical knowledge is emerging one step at a time. And so we're working with partners to drive that, the clinical understandings, right? To clarify the clinical importance of, of these infections um, in medicine. Um, and, but we also have our a business hat on too. And, and our focus is on quality. And that is our number one focus right now is to have the absolute best um, tests. And we recognize that new, technologies are often more expensive. So the pricing can be challenging, but we wanna reassure everyone that we're going after the reimbursements and, and we are doing this the right way. We also recognize that there's a convenience factor, right? So we, we do have a um, results portal for, for physicians and we understand that there, uh, you know, we have the sample collection kits and we understand that there are other things that we can do in order to uh, make ordering easier. Um, and we're working on those things, but we're, again, we're a, a small, tenacious, um, dedicated team and working with partners uh, in academia and, and in industry to just get this problem solved, right? And get better tools out there. So at